Snow Tracks is sponsored by ski -Doo. What matters is what's next. Yamaha Conquer Snow. And by FXR Racing Full Throttle Addiction. Sometimes it takes a little bit of driving to get to places that have some unique and interesting features, experiences, historical sites, or what have you. And this week, we're driving a little bit of a distance to the fringe of Ontario, Thunder Bay. It's kind of the most northwestern part before hitting the Manitoba border. And there's a lot of cool stuff in Thunder Bay. Most people don't know it or just think, hey, that's a long ways away. But I mean, truth is, for most Americans from the UP of Michigan or Wisconsin or all of those areas, it's easy to get to. It's 30% cheaper for Americans to go there with the exchange rate. And there is a ton of cool stuff to do. A lot of the times on these trips, I want to go from point A to point B by sled. But the truth is, I miss out on a lot of really cool opportunities and unique experiences. So this is kind of our, I guess we're going to call it our bucket list experience in Thunder Bay. First, we're going to stop probably at uh, Kakabeka Falls, which is a really cool falls. The snowmobile trail goes right over top of it. After that, we're going to try to hit up uh, Silver Mountain Station. And then finally, I really wanted to go to White Otter Castle. It's a huge home built out in the absolute middle of nowhere. But in the wintertime, the only way to get to White Otter Castle is to go by sled, unless you're into going 30K snowshoe or by ski. And it's pretty cool. It's right off the trail. We're going to meet up with some folks there and have a good time. It was a pretty long drive headed up to Thunder Bay, but when we got in, we were excited to, um, you know, to be there, be able to get a good night's sleep. And then the next morning, we were gonna wake up, meet Paul Pepe, who's with Tourism in Thunder Bay and Northwestern Ontario. Had uh, breakfast with Paul Pepe, who's a local tourism guy, and he's gonna be pretty much taking care of us while we're on the ground here. So now let's get geared up, pack everything up, and head out to Kakavaka Falls, which is literally just like 15 minutes outside of town. Really cool spot. It's pretty much the trailhead for all of Thunder Bay, so that's where we're going. All right. So when we arrived at Kakabeka Falls, we were gonna meet up with Adrian Tessier, who's a member of the club in Thunder Bay, and he was gonna be able to sort of walk us through a little bit of the history of Kakabeka Falls and tell us some of the neat and interesting facts that we weren't aware of. Tell us about Kakabeka Falls and why it's so important to the Thunder Bay area. So the start of the trail is basically in the village, like I said, a kilometer from here. And the trail goes across this bridge just up above the falls here, which is a really pretty sight. And from here, the trails go right to the Manitoba border. And tell us a little bit about the falls, why it's pretty unique. Well, Kakabeka Falls is, is commonly referred to as the Niagara of the North, and we're quite proud of it. It's a beautiful waterfalls. As you can see, it's kind of iced over. This is the Kamenistiqua River. It's a quite a historic river back in the Northwest Company days, the trading posts and whatnot. It was a trading route that was used quite regularly. Kakabeka Falls, of course, was a, a bit of an issue, and there's a portage that goes around here. The unique feature here is that we actually get to cross the falls as part of the trail. That's something that, I mean, you know, where else do you do this in Ontario? This is this is great. So. The trail actually goes clean across. The park is totally cool with this. In fact, they're encouraging of using their parking lot in the wintertime. The Kekebeka Falls Park is, is, is part of our community. They're one of the residents of our area, and uh, they fully understand tourism, and, and that's what parks are all about. You know, everybody talking about their bucket list, they got a whole chain of things. So you come up here, you can take a lot of history on your bucket list and check them off. and, and check them off with memories that you keep for a long, long time. People that see Kekebeka Falls remember that forever. They go home, they talk to their friends about it because it is a really great thing to see. Snow Tracks is sponsored by MBRP Performance Exhaust. Race inspired, trail proven. So the second stop on our Thunder Bay bucket list was Silver Mountain Station. And when you pull up to Silver Mountain Station, an old train station from, you know, yesteryear, you look at it and you go, are you sure that this is a train station? Because I don't see any train tracks. I don't see any flat area. I mean, what exactly is this place? I was excited to find out. 
It was built in uh, 1907, and it was part of the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway, and it's the last standing station of that line. The North Lake Station, which was the sister station, was burned down in 2004. That's obviously restoration. Yeah, after they lifted it and put the basement under? Yeah. And that was in the 70s, you said? Yeah. See where this here is? That's actually the bar now. OK. Where that's, that was the ticket booth. But my busiest months are August, September, and October. And you're doing a lot of murder mysteries during that time? Yep. Yeah, that's kind of the... I've been doing them all year. They get more popular and more popular. Cool. I started the murder mystery dinners because I was trying to figure out how to make this place go 12 mm -hmm. months a year. Yeah. You, they get right dressed up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I checked out some of the pictures. It looks like people get into it pretty good. Yeah, they get right... Yeah. Right excited about it and <laughs> they're ready to their part and then you get the people that go, well, I don't want to play, I don't want to play. So I have spectator roles, right? But I always say, everybody, know your role. The, usually, yeah. sometimes, most of the time, the spectators are the ones that are, that are the wildest. Yep. You've had this book reprinted. You now have the licensing rights to the, copy the whole and publishing thing, rights. copy yep. and publishing rights. So you had it actually taken back to the press again because there was no more copies. Right. So tell us about Lady Lumberjack and the whole, the history of it. Lady Lumberjack uh, ran this train station in 1907 until the other people with seniority in 1912 said, oh no, we want to do that. We've been here longer. She was the first unmarried woman to be granted a homestead in Ontario. She was one of three people to win the Canadian Authors Publishing Award across Canada and the only woman. Oh, cool. There are some people that live today that knew her. She lived to 99, she died in 1979. Wow. So she was, she didn't build it? No. Okay. No. This is built by the Port Arthur Duluth and Western Railway. And, and they let her a, come in and be the one to first run it. Yeah. Which would have been, I mean, that would have probably set some precedent for the day. That wouldn't have been, hap, that wouldn't have happened anywhere. No. Yeah, that wasn't a lady's job in the day, right? That That's was, right. Wow. Is this the, pretty much the uh, the remains of what once was here? Is is Silver Mountain Station. Yes. That's, that's all that really is left. Yes. Underneath the addition, is there any track left or was no. it all taken? It was all taken. It was all, uh, yeah. yeah, interesting. <laughs> so where else can you snowmobile from Kekabeko Falls to 1907? Yeah, no, <laughs> nowhere I know of. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, go back in time, yep. All right, well, we uh, have finished up at Silver Mountain Station. Got my helmet, got my sled, and we're gonna head for Atacokan tonight, stay there, and then go out and see White Otter Castle, which everybody that I've talked to says is amazing. I'm pretty stoked about it, I'm excited to see it, but I'll be on my own for this next section and uh, meet up with a few folks out in Atacokan once we get there. So that's where we're going. So I left Silver Mountain Station and Adrian and the, uh, the rest of the team there, and I headed out on my own for Atacokan, which was about a two hour drive uh, on the sled. Got into Atacokan and I was actually gonna hook up with the truck and trailer there and then follow out to this point where we would leave to go visit White Otter Castle. Now you can ride right from Atacokan, but to save some time and be able to show you this, I needed to, uh, to hook up with a crew there and ride out by truck and trailer. When we met up with everybody, it was at this place called Brown's Clearwater Lodge. It's a little ways outside of Atacokan, not too far by truck and trailer. And that was the point right on a lake system that we were gonna hook up and go see the White Otter Castle. It's about 20 miles by sled from uh, Brown's Clearwater into the castle. And it was a pretty cool ride. I mean, there'd been some wind and some drifting on the lake. So you had some, you know, kind of wind lips that you were hitting as you were going along, but it's staked out and it's very easy to find your way to White Otter Castle. The ride out was nice. It was a very cold day, about minus 27. And uh, it stayed that way most of the day, but we had a great time and, and the ride out was really fun. So my first initial impressions of the castle as you're pulling up from the water is, wow, this thing is really big. You know, it's, it's sizable. This would be a good size house in, in today's time. I mean, this would be a large, large home. So when we first pulled in, the crew that I was with, you know, they've been there a whole lot of times. It's nothing new to them. For me, I wanted to jump off and go check it out inside because I mean, this is so unique and so new and so cool. 
I just wanted to get in there and look at all the stuff and sort of experience this White Otter Castle. We're out here at White Otter Castle, which only get to by snowmobile in the wintertime. 20 mile ride in from the nearest um, sort of place that you can drop a truck and trailer. But the cool part is this is accessible by so many loops out of Thunder Bay or out of Atacokan or wherever. I mean, you can get to this point just a little bit off the beaten path, but it's well marked, it's easy to get here. And the really neat part is that there's a little uh, shack outside that's got all kinds of cool information. There's this, like all these plaques inside this building. It's completely accessible and you can get inside and walk around and go do whatever you want. Like it's, it's cool, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to explore. It's kind of cool to think that like this timber right here was lifted up by one man almost a hundred years ago the guy just had the tenacity and the, I guess, strength, even though he was a small guy, Jimmy McQuaid, to be able to lift this stuff up here and do this. I mean, sure, there's been some restoration and there's some new beams, but these, these gray colored ones, that's original. That guy did that by hand. He hand cut them out of the forest behind here, dragged them over, hewed them flat with an ax. I mean, no sawmill, no nothing. The guy just did all of this. It's crazy. The beautiful part about snowmobiling and seeing a place like White Outer Castle in the wintertime, when you go with friends, you can start a fire, you can bring along your lunch, you can just have a little bit of a cookout and enjoy your time. And that's exactly what it's about when you go to a place like this, you know? Don't just stop by, run inside, say you've been there, take a selfie and, and be gone. I really enjoyed my time here with the Atacokan Snowmobile Club and, and you know, their hospitality was, was just, you know, top notch. It was great. We really enjoyed standing around the fire and telling stories about sleds and riding and all kinds of different things. And I hope this bucket list has given you a little bit of uh, an inclination as to what you could do in the Thunder Bay and Northwestern Ontario area. And for us, we're headed out. We're going back to Perch Lake Lodge, which is a snowmobile friendly experience, snowmobile friendly resort. We're going to uh, get a good meal, have a good night's sleep and call it a day. Snow Tracks is sponsored by snowmobileinquebec.com. Experience a ride you'll never forget. Trail Tech is sponsored by Princess Auto, a unique world of equipment, tools, and more. Being that it's the first week of March, and for many of us, the weather's starting to warm up and the sun's trying to burn through all of that snow, I thought, why not grab one of our Dirt Tracks rigs, bring it out of storage, and set it up for some nice early season spring thaw riding. ATVs and side-by-sides are used for all different seasons in all different areas, and here in the Great White North, we use ATVs for everything from plowing the roads to recreational riding. But when it comes to winter or cold weather use, most folks just grin and bear it when they could instead make the task much more enjoyable with just a couple of easy to install accessories. This is a Sportsman 1000 XP and it's very well equipped from the factory, but when you add in sub-zero temperatures, a call to my friends at Kimpex was needed. First things first, a Gen 2 Kimpex windshield and specific mount will go a long ways to keeping the wind and snow dust at bay. The shape of the windshield also moves air in a way that doesn't swirl above and end up pushing down the driver's back, but moves it further back and off the driver. The quick attach system means you can add the windshield in just seconds, and likewise, take it off when the weather warms up. While we're up here at the handlebars, it's pretty important to address the other obvious area of comfort, the hand grips. While it is nice to have a windshield and it does keep wind off your hands, heated hand grips are so much nicer. If you'll remember back to our snow bike build earlier this season, I actually used a similar set of Oxford heated grips. Today I have a set specifically for ATVs with the proper size inside diameter as well as a locking outside clamp fitting. This kit is super easy to install with a wiring harness included, loop connectors, and a self-resetting fuse. Each grip has a tidy wrapped harness and runs to the main harness that plugs into the intelligent heater control. It offers five heat settings as well as a battery saving mode, which turns the grips off if you forget to. With my digits now feeling warmer, I'd be amiss if I didn't tell you about the ultimate in cold weather protection, hand muffs. They look a little different, but if you've ever used them, you know just how well they work. From sleds to ATVs to just about anything with grips, these Kimpex hand muffs combined with the hot grips will keep your hands warm for hours for plowing the driveway or cruising the trails early season. They're a simple install with Velcro and a cinch cord and even have viewing windows on both sides so you can see your controls. The elastic neoprene gaiter ensures no snow dust or cold weather intrusion. And let me tell you, it's like a hot tub party for your hands in there. Now, one of the final areas to consider if you're riding early season or cold weather is traction. 
While the Sportsman 1K does have good stock tires on it, there's always room for improvement. Kimpex Trail Trooper is a non-directional, heavily lugged tire with horizontal V-shaped pattern and a healthy shoulder lug. In 26 by 14, these Trail Troopers will roost the snow, dirt, or mud with ease and help keep us from getting stuck in the slush we are no doubt going to be playing in over the next few weeks. And with six plies of carcass strength, they are a force to be reckoned with all year long, no matter the terrain. Making your Power Sports products more multifunctional is something that a lot of folks are looking to do these days. And an ATV is a great vehicle to do that with, whether it be cold weather riding, going to the ice fish hut, hunting, or any other number of various activities, adding a little cold weather protection can go a long ways in making those tasks or jobs a lot more enjoyable. Closed captioning of snow tracks is sponsored by Triton Trailers, built for adventure. Skidoo has done it again. They've thrown out everything you've come to know and love about the Rev XS, completely redesigning snowmobiling's most popular snowmobile. The all new Gen 4 Rev is different, so changed and so new, I am actually stressing how I can possibly cover all of this newness in the time allotted for this test ride. So here's how we'll do it. I'll list off all the changes and then cover the stuff that matters most important. There's a complete new chassis with a cast aluminum bulkhead, stamped steel pyramidal supports, and a welded sandwich style smooth, not thin, tunnel top aluminum heat exchanger. RAS3 hangs out up front with a full inch extra travel and revised geometry. On X packages, there's a bump steer fighting steering rack and a quick adjust four position parallelogram bar riser. The engine has been moved over two inches to the right in the chassis, while the entire width of the sled has been reduced by four inches. The driver now sits almost four inches further forward than on the Rev XS. The dual zone seat allows the rider to slide way ahead on a motorcycle profile at the front or stretch out and relax on the flat top rear profile. The footrests are completely open, allowing the rider's feet to angle outside of the narrowed bodywork when using aggressive body English in turns. The all-new 850cc engine produces a claimed 165 horsepower, but Skidoo has thrown in this twist. They claim this is the first snowmobile two-stroke engine to be as reliable and durable as a four-stroke. Hmm. The new 850 is crazy powerful, moving the Gen 4 Rev to the front of the 800 class in a heartbeat. It's plain stupid fast. That being said, this issue of four-stroke durability is more than marketing hype. The 850 uses a two-piece forge crank, crack cap connecting rods, and double row open bearings at the clutch and mag end with their own pinpoint oiling nozzles. The 850's aluminum pistons are made with a built-in cast iron ring land like a diesel engine. The 850 engine has been narrowed up by more than three inches with the use of a new flat stator on the mag end of the crank and the new P-drive primary on the left end of the crankshaft. This narrowing and centering of the engine is what allows for the Gen 4's radical rider forward ergos. The rider can move so far forward straddling the narrow bodywork, you almost feel like you can touch the spindles. The centered engine further centralizes mass in the side-to-side -side plane, while the rider enjoys the benefit of Gymkhana-like freedom of movement when railing twisties. The new P-Drive roller tower primary is breakthrough technology which will inevitably be copied. The concept is so good, so simple, yet so efficient, it is the future of CVTs. There's more about the engine you need to know. The Raves are now cable servo activated in three stages. New Gen 2 E-Tech injectors work in concert with new booster injectors, adding impressive urgency to engine spool up when combined with the two pound lighter crankshaft. The net effect of all these components produces near telepathic, immediate, crisp throttle response. Prepare to have your arms stretched. You will be impressed with the electric oil pump's engine oiling efficiency. Skidoo is claiming as much as 900 miles to a tank of oil, making it possible to top off the injector tank just once a season. So what isn't changed from the XS? There are precious few holdouts, namely the 137 R-Motion skid out back, handlebar switch gear and gauges, and you could argue that the pilot tunable skis are an encore. We've been vocal in our criticism of Rev XS and XP handling. The former front end, even after multiple geometric tweaks, remain nervous, 
vague on center, and often required excessive effort to saw at the bars. The Gen 4 takes rev handling to a new, flatter level, and although we won't proclaim superiority for the new rev, it is now at a level which should please a broader section of riders. The ability to move forward and crowd the front of the sled in turns produces flat, linear turn-in, which remains steady to the apex. It's a remarkable change from the former XP and XS chassis. The 800 Renegade has been a hit for Skidoo. It has consistently been one of the best trail crossover sleds in the industry. The new 850 Gen 4 Renegade may require some owners to rethink how they ride. And we are interested to see if they remain just as passionate and as loyal to the Renegade. Snow Tracks has been sponsored by Polaris. See endless possibilities. Art to Cat. Share our passion. And by Northwest Ontario. What are you doing this weekend? If you enjoyed the video that you just watched, like it and then subscribe to our page for more great content from Snowtracks TV.